Okay, so we are back uh, at the beginning of Stila's theorem again. Uh, it is completely YouTube's fault. All YouTube does is it puts more and more ads in videos. That's all it does. Um, it doesn't actually do anything to enhance the experience. If anything, whatever it does, it further degrades everything. But anyway, let's go through it once more. So we have the statement of Silas theorem here in front of us. We have already seen this, um, but okay. So G is a finite group, P is a prime, and alpha is a non-negative integer such that P to the power alpha divides the order of G. Then the claim is that G has a subgroup whose order is this number, P to the power alpha. Now, the case where alpha is 0 is rather easy because in this case the hypothesis becomes this which is in fact true for any g any finite group g and any prime p in this special case you can actually take in place of p any prime that's because this is just one and one of course divides every positive integer and the claim is that in this case uh, that g has a subgroup of order one and there is always one such subgroup which is the trivial group so that means this in this case it's okay the claim is true and that is why we can safely assume alpha to be a positive integer all right now in this text there are three proofs of Silas theorem and this is the first one that we are going to do today it is due to someone named Wieland and it is combinatorial and number theoretic in nature and Wieland's proof also has the advantage that here we will actually see a subgroup whose order is p to the power alpha now because the proof is combinatorial in nature we are um, in the beginning of the proof the author considers a binomial coefficient and then says something about that so let's see that first because p to the power alpha divides the order of g so it is of this form for some positive integer m for some natural number m now the question the author asks is this what power of p divides this binomial coefficient now we need to first explain what this means what does it mean what power of p divides this you consider this number 12 we know that 12 is 2 square times 3 now we see that 2 divides 12 and 2 square also divides 12 in fact 2 to the power 0 curse also divides 12 but the higher powers of 2 none of them divides 12 for example 2 cube does not divide 12 the fourth power also does not divide 12 and so on so among all these powers of 2 where the exponent is a non-negative integer the largest power of 2 that divides 12 is the second one i mean, I mean second in the sense uh, not considering this one considering this as the first power so when the author is asking what power of p divides this it means that he is asking what is that largest power of p that divides this binomial coefficient okay by the way why are we suddenly considering out of nowhere uh, 
this binomial coefficient that will become clear when we see the actual proof but we are going to need this so let us now first answer this so let's first apply the definition of this binomial coefficient you know that it is just this p to the power alpha m factorial divided by this factorial times this factorial. Now if one expands the numerator and in the denominator one expands, uh, well not expands but a part of the numerator is this, this thing, not this one but this one. So after cancellation of those uh, common factors, we will be left with this. If you start expanding this, you will, it will look like this, right? Minus 1. Then there will be a general term, alpha m minus I and we will stop before reaching this number which is p to the power alpha m minus p to the power alpha plus 1 okay because after that you have this and then the next one and so on so that becomes this factorial so that thing gets cancelled and we are left in the denominator with the factorial of p to the power alpha. That also we write in this form format like this. Alpha minus i and finally of course you get 1 but uh, I mean uh, because we want to somehow match these factors in the denominator with the ones in the numerator. So that last one we are going to write like this. Instead of simply writing 1, we write p to the power alpha minus p to the power alpha plus 1. Okay. Now, Now we are going to observe something about these, these numbers. But before that, let us also note one small thing that here i lies in this, I mean i is within this range. If you look carefully, this term this last factor in the numerator can also be written like this minus p to the power alpha minus 1 so that is the largest value of i which you are subtracting from p to the power alpha m okay so that's why that minus of minus becomes plus 1 and we have minus p to the power alpha and the same thing is also true in the denominator. So both in the numerator as well as the denominator, i varies like this. All right. Now, suppose p to the power beta is the largest power of p that divides this general factor in the numerator which means that p to the power beta divides p to the power alpha m minus i where our i is general okay it can be any one of these possibilities and the next higher power does not divide p to the power alpha m minus i that means this is the largest power of p that divides this number. What we are now going to see is that 
this will precisely also be the largest power of p that divides this one in the denominator okay so that means we have to see two things we have to prove that p to the power beta divides this and then p to the power beta plus 1 does not divide this okay now from this divisibility relation what do we get p to the power alpha m minus i is equal to p to the power beta times k for some positive integer k because that's what divisibility means all right now if this exponent beta is greater than or equal to alpha then what happens let's see what is the consequence of this supposition okay if we suppose that beta is at least alpha what do we get from this equation then p to the power alpha is going to divide p to the power alpha m minus p to the power beta k why p to the power alpha of course divides this first term p to the power alpha m because it's simply it's there and it also divides this p to the power beta k because it divides p to the power beta and that is because beta is greater than or equal to alpha so at least we have p to the power alpha here in this power of p, p to the power beta and maybe something else also but this is i okay so the consequence is that p to the power alpha divides i but is that possible that is not possible because you see i is less than p to the power alpha and also i is positive so this is not possible we have got a contradiction that means this inequality is not true so we must have the opposite inequality which means that we must have beta less than alpha but this also has a consequence when we look at this equation again using this equation now what is it that we are going to get now we will get p to the power beta dividing this again let us argue like that p to the power beta this time it divides this term because it's there and it also divides p to the power alpha because now alpha is larger than beta so p to the power beta is available here and in fact there is at least one more p also we don't need that but it's there so it divides this difference which is i this minus this is equal to i so now we are getting that p to the power beta divides i but because of this inequality we also have this divides p to the power alpha obviously because beta is less than alpha hence this divides p to the power alpha minus i so you see that if p to the power beta is dividing this then just like what we were claiming or what we were trying to show it now divides this corresponding term in the denominator but that's not all we claimed that that is actually the largest power of p dividing this nothing higher can divide this let's see what happens if we forcefully suppose that the next higher power divides this suppose this divides 
p to the power alpha minus i. Note that we still have this inequality. And this inequality, because we are dealing with integers, so this inequality also means that beta plus 1 is less than or equal to alpha. Note that here it seemed like the strictness of the inequality is of no use after all. It was of no use here, but in this part it will have use because now we can say that beta plus 1 is also less than or equal to alpha. It is not exceeding alpha. Okay. Thus, p to the power beta plus 1 will divide p to the power alpha because it is less than or equal to alpha. So, this will now, you see, it divides this and it will, it divides this also. So, it has to divide p, I mean i because it divides this minus of this. Okay, so it is now dividing i. Combining this with this, you see, this already divides p to the power alpha, so of course it will divide this we get divides this minus i. So, you combine this and this and you get this. But that is not possible. Okay. So, we have again obtained a contradiction. So that means this supposition is wrong. In other words, we should get this. So just like these relations, p to the power beta dividing this number and the next higher power not dividing this number, p to the, where is that? p to the power beta divides this number in the denominator and the next higher power does not divide this. Now, what is the consequence of this thing? It means that whatever power you are going to get of p from here, that same power is going to appear in the denominator also. And this precisely equal powers are going to get cancelled. And p to the power alpha of course already gets cancelled in the beginning itself which means that after all these cancellations okay there will be no p left at all except for any possible p that m may have right after all these cancelling because you see that is why we paid so much attention in writing these things similarly because we are going to get the same powers, uh, same power of p here and here, they get cancelled. Here and here, they get cancelled. For every such pair of like terms, uh, the powers of p get cancelled. So only whatever m is going to provide us with, that power of p will survive. That is why the largest power of p that divides this binomial coefficient is also the largest power of p that divides m. Okay. So, if p to the power r divides m and p to the power r plus 1 does not divide m. So, p to the power r is the largest power of p dividing m. Then that is also the case for this.
okay now armed with this knowledge now we are going to start the actual proof So this is the first proof. In the proof what we do is we consider a collection N. In the text this type of M is written but uh, let's not be that fancy we can just write simply the elements in n are subsets of g those subsets whose number of elements is p to the power alpha of course m will be a <coughs> excuse me non empty collection because why? Because p to the power alpha divides the order of g and so definitely p to the power alpha is not greater than the order of g, it is less than or equal to the order of g. So in g we are going to find this many elements at least and accordingly there will be subsets having uh, that many elements. So there will be some sets which are elements in n. All right. And now note that from combinatorics, we know that there are how, in how many ways can we choose a subset of G that has this many elements. That number is nothing but this binomial coefficient. Or in old notation, it is order of g c p to the power alpha and order of g is that thing so that's how this number arises that is the number of elements in m is this okay now the next thing uh, the author does is the author introduces a binary relation on the set M tilde like this for any two sets which are elements in M we define m1 to be related to m2 if m1 is equal to m2 g for some g in g there is no confusion about what m2 g is m2 g is the set of all elements of the firm something from m2 times g and that is just the, using the uh, product that is there in the group, the binary operation. So that set is M to G. So we say that M1 is related to M2 if M to G is equal to M1 for some group element G. Now it is really easy to see that this is an equivalence relation on M, but let's just go through the details. It's not very long. Suppose you consider three elements in M. Three because we need to show transitivity also. Note that M1 is equal to M1 E. E is the identity element in G. If you are going to multiply every element of M1 with E, then you are going to get back that element. So that's why it is nothing but M1. So that way M1 is related to m1 
So every element in G in M is related to itself. So that's why this relation is reflexive. tilt is reflexive. Next we want to show symmetry. So for that we assume that M1 is related to M2. Then by definition of this relation M1 is equal to M2 G. For some G in G. And from this one can prove easily that M2 is equal to M1 G inverse. Just understand one thing, okay? No matter how quick this looks and no matter how natural this looks, always remember it has to be proved at least once you have to see for yourself that yes, this is how it is true. But let's not uh, dive into those details. I leave it to you. Okay. You, you. But keep in mind, proving this means what? Proving this means that this set and this set are equal. And showing that again involves showing that each one is a subset of the other. That, that's how it has to be proved. And in that proof, you will use this. But it, it is true. Okay. Let's now assume that this is true. So that means M2 is related to M1. So our relation is symmetrical. So. And finally, we want transitivity. So for transitivity, we need two relations. Um, so one of them is say this one itself and we also assume additionally that m2 is related to m3 then m2 will be equal to m3 say h for some h in h we then use these two equations this one and this one and write m1 equal to m2g in place of m2 we write m3h uh, yeah m3hg and this thing equals m3hg see there is here also there is something to see it is not just that you carelessly write M3HG and do not even consider what went on here. We are able to write this from this because we have associativity. That's why. But HG is again an element of G. So that's why M1 is related to M3. This proves that our relation is transitive. So that's why it's an equivalence relation. Now this equivalence relation is going to of course partition M into disjoint equivalence classes. So instead of writing an equation, let us draw a simple diagram. The author also hasn't written any equation but has said something about the situation in words. So this is how it's going to look. So this is your M. Okay, now in M you have equivalence classes. Do not make, make the mistake of thinking that 
these sets are equivalence classes no they are elements in m and that is why the author has chosen to use a different font for writing this m not a, an ordinary english capital letter m but an m like this so that we do not confuse uh, i mean we do not get confused with what these elements are in the hierarchy of sets these sets themselves are elements in m but anyway you understand what the situation is so there are equivalence classes here now note that m is finite in fact we know what the order of m is that order is just this all right and so all the equivalence classes are also finite and if we add the number of elements in all the equivalence classes then we have to get the number of elements in m that is this one that is the purpose of partitioning this it's a way of counting a, i mean uh, measuring the size of a large set as the sum of the sizes of some smaller sets so in that equation if you write that thing as an equation it will look like this this is the order of m and here you have orders of these equivalence classes whatever they are okay we don't know what they are but there will be some positive integers here and it will be a finite sum now remember that we have already seen that p to the power r plus 1 does not divide this number p to the power r divides this number but p to the power r plus 1 does not divide this number and what is r r is coming from m p to the power r is the largest power of p dividing m it is from there that it is coming now if every size all the sizes of this equivalence classes are divisible by p to the power r plus 1 then of course this sum is divisible by p to the power r plus 1 in that case p to the power r plus 1 has to divide this which is not possible so that is why there will be at least one equivalence class whose number of elements is not divisible by p to the power r plus 1 there should be at least one maybe there are more but at least one will be there so let this be such an equivalence class its elements are going to be what ultimately this ms let us recall what the ms are each m here you see and in fact elsewhere also in capital m each m is after all what it is a subset of g whose number of elements is p to the power alpha that's what these things are so this is an equivalence class such that its size its number of elements which is n is not divisible by p to the power r plus 1 okay all right now for now for any i and 
any g belonging to g you consider that set m i g by the definition of our relation tilde this m i g is going to be what it is going to be related to m i right because that is the definition of our relation related to m i means uh, it will be in this class because this is where the m uh, i mean uh, we are choosing i from here means our m i is coming from here now all the elements that are related to m i are inside this class only in particular this element is related to m i so it has to be some m from here so this is equal to m j for some j now many different kinds of things can happen when you choose any arbitrary uh, choosing i from here means choosing one of these m i you multiply that by some group element anything you are going to get something from here now among all these possibilities uh, we can concentrate on this thing let h be the set of those elements in g which if you uh, use it to multiply m1 you get m1 back maybe that is that is also a possibility among all these possibilities maybe there is some element in g such that m1 g becomes m1 itself we are now going to concentrate on this subset of g it is a subset of g after all the first thing we see is that e belongs to h that is because m1 e is of course equal to m1 which means that h is non empty h is a non empty subset of g now let us take two elements a and b in h then by the definition of h m1 a is m1 and m1 b is also m1 so now if we calculate m1 a b then uh, due to associativity this will be m1 a times b and that will be equal to this is m1 so we get m1 b and that is also m1 so just like this things m1 a b is also equal to m1 so by the definition of h a b belongs to h that means h is not just a non empty subset of g but it is also closed now because g is a finite group this is enough to being closed is enough to conclude that h is a subgroup of g in general you would also have to show that inverse i mean uh, you take any element of h its inverse is also in h that is needed but finiteness uh, allows us to conclude here itself h is a subgroup of g now we want to see what happens to this order of h our claim is that this is actually equal to p to the power alpha that means this is a subgroup that we are seeking that now we are going to do so this is the this is going to be the final part of the proof
Now, before we see this part, we need to do something else also with that equivalence class consisting of those m i's. And the thing we need to do is we need to, now that we have shown that this is a subgroup, we are going to define a function Okay, what is R H? R H is the set of all right cosets of H in G. We will write this here itself. Okay, let us first define the function H G F is M one G. where R H is the set of all right cosets of H in G. I used this notation in some previous exercise. I don't remember where, but okay. Now this is itself not necessarily a group. It will be a group if, if and only if H is normal. It is then it will be the quotient group of G by A, but we don't need that. Okay, as a set, it's a legitimate set. Now, what is the definition? The input right coset H G gets mapped by F onto the set M one G. Does it make sense? Yes, it makes sense because M one G by definition of our relation is going to be related to m1 and because this is the equivalence class of m1 this m1 g is going to be some you see here take uh, i equal to 1 it is going to be some mj so we are going to fall here itself in this set but that's not enough to claim that f is well defined you need to also make sure that this output for this input is unique otherwise it's not a function so let's see that first. Suppose H G1 and H G2 belong to R H such that H G1 is equal to H G2. Now we know that a single coset can have different representations. You can have different elements giving you the same coset. So that's why here it becomes very important to show uniqueness of output. Okay, now this means G1, G2 inverse belongs to H. But from the definition of H, this is going to mean that M1, G1, G2 inverse is equal to m1 and from this one can prove that m1 g1 is equal to m1 g2 i say one can prove because it really needs a proof and it is that kind of proof that i was asking you to do back there now what is m1 g1 it is h g1 f and m1 g2 is h g 2 f. So, if inputs are equal then outputs are also equal. So, f is well defined. This part is not there in the text. In fact, the final conclusion that this part is going to give us is what is, uh, is there in the text and the author simply asks us to prove it ourselves. So, f is well defined. Next, if one runs this argument backwards, then one gets that f is 1 to 1. How? Let us consider 
any two right cosets h a and h b such that the corresponding outputs are equal if we can then show that the inputs are also equal then that would mean that f is one to one injective so by the definition of f this is m1 a is equal to m1 b you will see after we complete that part that that is basically just these implication uh, well not these implications but the reverse implications um, yeah, all the reverse implications starting from here and ending here. A B inverse is equal to M one. Again, this can be proved from this. All right. Now again, by the definition of H, this means that A B inverse belongs to H. And because h is a subgroup so this just means ha is equal to hp so that proves that f is one to one so what else is there to do with f namely showing that f is onto so for ontoness you choose any element from here say m i for some i whatever i is Because m i is here, so m i is going to be related to m 1 and that is why m i will be equal to m 1 g for some g belonging to g. But then m i is equal to m 1 g and that is nothing but the f image of h g. So that's how m i has been shown to be the output under f for the input a g everything is an output so that is why f is on to as well F is okay so we have found a one-to-one -one correspondence between two finite sets one of them on that side is is that equivalence class how many elements are there n and on this side the set is the set of all right cosets of h in g both of them are finite and due to the presence of this bijection f they will now have the same number of elements that is why what is the number of elements in r h by definition that is the index of h in g and on the right side the size of that equivalence class is n and this implies from the proof of Lagrange's theorem we know that the order of h times its index is the order of the whole group so that's why n times order of h is equal to order of g so here how nicely this has come we already know that the order of g will be order of h times something that is Lagrange's theorem right but here something additional is also happening this something which we know as the index turns out to be the size of that congruence I mean sorry not congruence class the equivalence class okay now we know that this thing is p to the power alpha times n all right now from this we will uh, 
apply some numbered theoretic arguments note that p to the power r plus 1 does not divide n this is something we already know however uh, oh yes okay also do you remember that p to the power r divides m and in fact this is the largest power of p dividing m and this also turned out to be the largest power of p dividing that binomial coefficient so m is a multiple of this something say k for some positive integer k now if you substitute this here then we are going to get n is equal to sorry n times order of h is equal to then p to the power alpha plus r times k all right thus p to the power alpha plus r or to make it even more clear let me write like this r plus alpha divides from this equation we get this divides n times order of h now you look at this and you look at this here we have p to the power r plus 1 at least why because in the beginning itself we have uh, we have uh, removed the case alpha equal to 0 alpha is positive for us now so this thing is going to divide this however p to the power r plus 1 does not divide n now if it happens that p to the power alpha does not divide the order of h then in order for this division to properly happen p to the power r plus 1 would have to divide n why you see suppose p to the power alpha does not divide the order of h means what something less divides the order of h some lower power of p divides the order of h but then whatever is left here is at least p to the power r plus 1 then the remaining division has to take place with n but that is being prohibited by this relation that is why p to the power alpha must divide the order of h it's like a job has been given to this power the job is divide the uh, this thing this quantity so if p to the power alpha is it fails to do the job with order of h pro fully then the remainder has to be done by p to the power uh, i mean whatever else is left in this power but that means at least p to the power r plus 1 has to divide n but that is not true so that's why p to the power alpha must divide the order of h and because these are all positive integers so this in particular implies that p to the power alpha is less than or equal to the order of h However, we will now show that the reverse inequality is also true. How? You choose any element m1 in m1. Okay. Oh, by the way, can you choose this? Yes, you can. Why? 
because m1 has p to the power alpha number of elements and that is never zero okay it is it can be one but it is never zero so m1 is non empty so you can choose something from m1 now for each element h in h m1 h belongs to m1 why that's because from the definition of capital h we know that for any h in h m1 h is equal to m1 so that means this for this element m1 m1 h is going to be in m1 so that way every element of h is going to give an element in m1 are we getting distinct elements in m1 for distinct elements in h in this way yes we are getting how say this is your h and this is your m1 you choose something some h1 here here you get m1 h1 you get h2 here you get m1 h2 if h1 is not equal to h2 then that implies m1 h1 is also not equal to m1 h2 why because we are in a group and we have the cancellation loss if these two are equal then cancelling out m1 from both sides will give you h1 equal to h2 so that is why distinct elements in h are going to give us distinct elements in m1 and that is why there are at least as many elements in m1 as there are in h maybe more but not less okay which means what that the order of h is less than or equal to the order of m1 but what is the order of m1 p to the power alpha so that way we get the reverse inequality as well and combining these two inequalities you finally get this and that's where silas first theorem i mean uh, the first proof is over now this proof of course has a corollary because i mentioned the corollary in the previous video previous video means the original one so let me do it here also So the corollary is just this. If p to the power m divides the order of g, you see, in the original Silas theorem, we did not restrict alpha in any way other than the fact that alpha is a non-negative integer. But now, in place of alpha, we are going to take the largest possible value of alpha, and that is m. And the next higher power does not divide the order of g. Then g has the subgroup of order p to the power m. It is actually nothing but restating the original Silas theorem statement for this particular alpha, the largest possible alpha. And any subgroup of G having this largest possible power order. is called a p hyphen sila read as p sila subgroup of g 
okay so that's where the original video ended so let me end this one also here so that's just it uh, for tonight our uh, next upload is uh, what is the date today i think it's thursday no? so this coming saturday the so saturday but what are the things that we usually have on saturdays we have uh, calculus and we have lee's algebra because right now we are in the middle of solving exercises so you will see community posts so see you on saturday in the community section with new solutions to exercise problems until then this is me lucifer from a mathematical room have a nice night